Senator Chuck Speaker tonight. Uh, as as uh, Frank as Frank Holloman, uh, most of us know Frank. Frank's a good friend of ours. He's been a member of the Native Plant Society since a long time. One of our uh, founding folks, I guess, as he's been with us a long, long time. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, but uh, I could come out classify Frank as one of our true conservation heroes uh, in, in our state and across the Southeast. So a little bit of background on Frank. Uh, Frank was born in Seneca, South Carolina. He attended Furman University, uh, where he, and he graduated from Harvard Law School. Uh, and uh, he served as a Deputy Secretary of Education uh, under Clinton from 1999 to uh, 20, January uh, 20, 2000. Uh, and he served as the Chairman of the South Carolina Democratic Party from 1988 to 1990. And uh, so, uh, so Frank has uh, currently serves as a, a Senior Litigation Attorney for the Southern Environmental Law Center. Uh, where he has led uh, efforts to uh, mitigate uh, power utilities disposal of coal ash. And uh, he's done great work with that. But uh, Frank has been personally responsible for saving thousands of acres across South Carolina through his work for just con general conservation and also the National Land Trust. Uh, he's a passionate uh, uh, defender of the bunched arrowhead, which he's going to talk about tonight. Uh, so we're truly honored to have Frank come speak to us tonight. And so, Frank, your floor is yours. And thank you, buddy, for coming to speak to us tonight. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. This is a great organization. And uh, I've met some of my best friends here. And it constantly does great things. So I encourage everybody on here to get involved as much as possible. Tonight, I'm going to speak speak about one of my favorite topics, the bunched airhead. I've been accused of being the bunched airhead whisperer. And uh, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. So I'm going to spend most of the time with the shared screen. And let's see if this works. I'm doing what Dan Witten told me to do. Host disabled participant screen sharing, according to the Yes, screen. I'll get it. I'll get it right here. Just a second here, Frank. Okay. Okay, let's see. Now, do you all see my screen? Yep. Yep. You do? Everyone does. Okay, I'm going to start this show then. Uh, I'm often asked, what is a bunched airhead? That is the bunched airhead. Uh, I, I have to recognize again for those who weren't here on the, in the, on the uh, meeting tonight is Dr. Jill Newberry, who was uh, uh, leading the charge for the bunched airhead before bunched airhead was cool, if it's cool now. Uh, and she's done phenomenal research and conservation activities for years and years before I knew what it was. So it's a real honor to have her on this call. But this is the plant. It is a federal, this is an important point. It is a federally listed endangered species. That means it has the protection of the Endangered Species Act to the extent that act protects plants. And uh, it offers more protection for plants sometimes than our plant advocates think. This plant, here's another example of a population uh, looking, this is sort of what it would look like if you could sit in the bog at the Blackwell Heritage Trust Preserve and look up toward the prairie or toward the pasture or toward the field, the place where we work. You see one of these plants is blooming. Um, this plant is, rare. It's rare in that it, it exists only in a band in northern Greenville County, uh, uh, roughly, roughly from Berea north uh, to the northern limits of Traveler's Rest. It doesn't make it to Marietta or Cleveland. It doesn't make it further west, it doesn't make it really to the Saluda River on the west. There are no plants in the Saluda River it drainage itself. 
And then the uh, population ban goes over about to the outskirts of Greer, generally. It's found only in South Carolina. Most of the plants are in Greenville County. There are some plants across the line now, and uh, now limited to Henderson County, North Carolina, as I understand it. There may have been historically some plants in Buncombe County, but I think they are, have long since been lost. Now, this plant is, so it lit, lit, exists only in our county principally. And therefore, uh, I always make the pitch, and which I think is a true statement, uh, that we have a special responsibility for one of the rarest life forms on earth because for whatever reason, it's been entrusted to our care. Now, what I always like to emphasize to people is this is not like, say, a hydrangea where you could protect this plant by just not, you know, just putting it in a pot, protecting it. Uh, this plant is rare because it lives in a rare ecology. It is, it is a marker for an ecological system. It lives in what are called Piedmont seepage forests. And that kind of uh, environment largely exists in the area where this plant is. So we are not only home to a rare plant, we're home to a rare eco ecological uh, formation. And what these, this is not in the mountains. Uh, this is in the foothills where the, uh, at the foot of the mountains, we're talking about north of Traveler's Rest, but not as far as Marietta, I say. And the, uh, it's where the hillside comes down to a point and then the water drainage comes out of the base of the hillside and creates seepage. And this seepage with the right soils creates a mucky swamp. Sometimes it's just a seep that then flows into a stream and it will be a small mucky area. Sometimes for those of us who've worked at Blackwell Heritage Trust Preserve, it'll be acres of a swampy area and the plants will be hither and yon in there. And these plants are markers for that rare um, habitat. Now, what's important to know is you can't protect the plants by just protecting the plants. You have to protect the habitat. So you might think, well, we could just draw a circle around the swamp, protect the swamp. Well, that won't work either because the swamp is dependent upon the hydrologic recharge zone for the uphill area from which the water flows to keep the swamp going. Now, we've had relatively wet years uh, recently, so we've forgotten how severe drought can be in our area. But without that recharge zone, during dry years, this habitat would be eliminated. Uh, scientists don't really know and botanists don't fully know exactly what criteria the, uh, as to the nature of the soil and the pH and all that. They, the, the research has been done, We're not totally, uh, it's not like a formula, but we know these plants aren't in every wetland in that area by any means. And, and, uh, something would not survive in every well. They're only in some. Uh, so even within that area uh, where it, there aren't a huge number of wetlands, uh, it's not in every wetland. These plants live in the headwaters, as identified so far, of the innery. That's really the ground zero for these plants is the innery, as I'll show you in a minute. The reedy, Headwaters of the Reedy from Berea up, and also in the one area in particular in the Tiger River uh, in Taylor's, uh, where the watershed breaks between the Ennery and the Tiger. Uh, you, you don't find them in the Savannah. You don't find them in the Saluda, other than the Reedy being a tributary of the Saluda. And of course, they aren't further west, east into the Catawba. So they're in this limited head headwaters areas. You don't find them in a raging, strong, flowing river. So they're not gonna be in the Ennery River itself. They tend to be in these mucky, boggy, seepy areas at the hillside, at the base of the hillside, which ultimately a str little stream will flow out of and ultimately flow into the river or 
a stronger creek that then flows into the river. So that's what the plants are. They generally during the winter are hard to identify unless you know them because these leaves here don't appear then they disappear. They drop down and you just have these sort of florets at, at um, water level. But by this time of the year, these and the literature sometimes calls them spatula leaves come up and beginning really now uh, into June, they bloom the literature and you can find some later in the summer, the literature sometimes says you'll read blooms from June to August or June to July or something. But actually, I don't know whether it's climate change or whether uh, the researchers who started writing that just happened to stumble across some blooming that time of year, but actually they do start blooming much earlier. Now these plants are rare in part because of how much the world has changed and there are several threats, uh, many threats to these plants. The big one is loss of habitat. If you could imagine, go back in time, you had these ancient forests through this area at the base of the mountains, big ancient forests with the occasional wetland, swamp, seep areas that you would stumble onto. And if you get into one of these old swamps, you can, your mind can imagine that. Uh, but we don't have that anymore. What happened was the area was converted to agriculture by and large, a lot of pastures, a lot of farming, uh, homes were built, and then we had the textile industry. So there was a lot of pollution of the waterways. That wasn't good. You had a lot of these, seep, these swamps were drained. That was bad. You had many of them converted to cropland. That was bad. And sometimes if you over, if they get over impacted by cattle, that can destroy them too. So that's loss of habitat. Related to loss of habitat is disturbance of hydrology. I saw one stream system with a seep head that I would bet money had bunched airhead at one time, but somehow there was some kind of development uh, uphill, stormwater flowed downhill, flowed directly into that seep head and scoured out that stream. So whatever uh, bunched airheads were ever in that swamp or in that seep or in that headwaters were scoured away. So changes of hydrology due to increasing flows through swamps and little streams have scoured some populations out. And for others, it's because hard, hard surfaces and other things have been put on the recharge zone so that the, um, the swamp doesn't have as much water coming into it or distorted the flow of water coming into it. And in drought years, populations that existed were gone. Uh, and finally, I would say that the, another threat that we fought at Blackwell is exotics. Um, big one is privet. Another big one can be Japanese honeysuckle. Another, all the various hollies, exotic hollies that get in there and suck out water, magnolia suck out water, uh, English ivy, wisteria, um, all the various suite of exotics. And now there's a some exotic grasses that can coat over these wetlands in the right environment that are problems too. So these plants are rare in number now because of how they work, because they have a narrow ecological niche and uh, we have eliminated so many of them. Now I thought uh, it would be important to highlight what we all, all of us conservationists, Jill Newberry, uh, the uh, Native Plant Society, Southern Environmental Law Center, and the land trust I work with, uh, Natural Land Trust, the Clean Water Act, all Endangered Species Act have done to protect this plant. Let me give you some examples. You may know, uh, believe it or not, and this is true, Greenville County has very strong protections for this plant. It's sort of surprising, you might not expect that, but actually uh, Greenville County, uh, because of a, a situation that I'll get to later where we all and the local people who lived up there fought a development that would have partially impacted the, the Blackwell site, the Greenville County uh, Planning Commission staff put in a requirement uh, that before any development could come forward that was in the area where bunched arrowhead existed, they had to do a survey for bunched arrowhead and the bunched arrowhead plants. 
And the county council adopted an ordinance, uh, which later became controversial for other reasons, called 3.1 that said when a development was for consideration, one thing that had to be considered was endangered species. And when they said endangered species, they were referring to this plan. We don't have many others that affect development. Well, you may know, if those of you who follow this, we recently had a fight over the replacing, redoing our land development ordinance and the conservationists generally lost that fight. But even though we sort of lost that fight, the county council included a special provision aimed at protecting federally endangered and uh, threatened species. And that was because of the bunch airhead and all the issues that community members and we all had raised about development. So that's very important what Greenville County has done. Secondly, we've had multiple fights over developments. I'll illustrate those again, where uh, they would have either obliterated or adversely impacted the plants. And we have largely won every one of those, either by the developments have been abandoned or drastically changed to protect the plants. And it's been very important. We had a huge fight over Piedmont Natural Gas's proposed pipeline through Northern Greenville County, and that's still ongoing in a way, but they had to change their route multiple times to avoid populations of bunched arrowhead. And in fact, I heard this talk going on uh, before the meeting that I started talking in the early part of the meeting. We had people who lived up there said, can I plant bunched arrowhead in my yard to keep that power line uh, pipeline from coming through. I mean, the in Northern Greenville County, the bunched area has become like, uh, like the tiger is to Clemson University. It's become a real honored plant because not only do people recognize the, their special responsibility, it's also something that's helping to protect the rural feel of that area from excessive and unwise development. And the final thing I would mention is close to Jill Newberry's heart that we're fighting over. Often a companion plant of this plant in the same ecological area is a dwarf flowered heart leaf. And you all may have uh, listened to Jill's presentation about Peters Creek Heritage Trust Preserve in Spartanburg. That plant exists in a bigger area than the bunched arrowhead, but it is often in similar areas. And we stopped one development in Greenville County because of it, it would have wiped out populations of the dwarf flower Hartley. Well, unfortunately, an ill-advised uh, bureaucrat and the Fish and Wildlife Service has proposed to remove protections of the endangered species from the dwarf flower Hartley. And we at the Southern Environmental Law Center submitted a letter on behalf of the Native Plant Society and others objecting to that, as did Jill, as did South Carolina DNR, as did another known botanist who's familiar with this plant, Chick Gaddy, as did professors at Appalachian State who are conducting the most extensive studies of the door flower hardly. Protecting the status of that plant also helps to protect the ecologies and the natural habitat of the bunched area. All that's going on. I thought what might most illustrate this so, of the fight over the bunched airhead and what's happening are a series of maps over protected. These are protected areas north of Greenville County, uh, north of Traveler's Rest in Greenville County, east of Highway 25, as you can see, there are bunched airhead preserves. And this is how things stood in 2015 in this area. And this is right before the Native Plant Society got involved advocating in this particular area. Uh, this big green area here is the Bunched Arrowhead Preserve. It had been assembled first by the Nature Conservancy and then by DNR over a period of maybe 20 years. This is the original Blackwell Heritage Trust Preserve, which DNR had assembled with the help of mitigation requirements of the Clean Water Act. This is a private farm on which the owner put a conservation easement and there are a bunch of airhead here along the entry. This is the Bellevue Springs Heritage Trust Preserve that DNR put together uh, years ago to protect the population of the bunched airhead. So what you have is, here's the North Entry. It comes down like this. This is the Entry River and they join right in here. 
Okay. So first, the first step that happened with these two properties, Natural Land Trust, this property came up for sale, it's yellow property. And uh, Mary Bunch and I went out there. She used to be at uh, DNR for the Heritage Trust Program and was a real hero for the Airhead. We went out there and walked that property and lo and behold, we found the most beautiful multi-acre swamp right in here along the innery. And it is full of bunched airhead. And there are some PV white PVC pipes in there too. Uh, but it is, it is in some ways more impressive than the Blackwell Heritage Trust Preserve, frankly. It is really amazing. It's the most beautiful swamp. And uh, it'd be worth seeing that someday. Natural Land Trust was able to buy that. That is protected forever now, which is a big accomplishment. And we also, Natural Land Trust, also acquired this swamp from the same owner. Surprisingly, you can't find bunched airhead on this site. This may have something to do with exotics or it might have to do with soil types. We thought it was important to get this because it it's, has a hydrologic connection here and it almost creates connectivity between this and Bellevue Springs. So that's first step. Natural Land Trust adding those two new properties. Okay, next to first step in recent years when the Native Plant Society got involved. Now, this was when the Native Plant Society and others had a big impact. It was proposed on this yellow property here, place 50 some acres. I think it was well over 200 homes, multiple roads and cul de sacs. Wipe out a pond here, make it into a detention pond. This pond is full of bunched airhead, the stream entering it. And as Jill well knows, the significant, the bunched airhead are right down here in big numbers. That's where we've been working. But this is the recharge zone. This is, and believe it or not, this has been studied by academics very thoroughly. There's a multiple uh, a paper done by multiple professors pointing out how important this is. And one of Jill's early recommendations was that this recharge zone needed to be protected. When that development came up, we all pulled out all the stops. And I sent multiple letters uh, pointing out how this would violate the Endangered Species Act and the Clean Water Act for reasons I could explain, but just take that for granted. Um, that representing the Native Plant Society for SELC. A lot of individuals sent letters, the community really raised the alarm first. And the end result was the developer said he didn't want to be involved in an environmental fight that wasn't his world and he abandoned the development. Then we spent months and weeks, weeks and months talking with the owner, with DNR, and in the end, through a grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, $5,000 in matching money from Natural Land Trust and DNR big money in, this was acquired and added to the Heritage Trust Preserve. That is one of the biggest environmental and conservation victories, even though it's just 50 acres we ever had. And as you can see, it creates technical connectivity now between Blackwell and uh, the Bunch Airhead Preserve, which is very important to have that kind of protection where we can. So that's that site. And that's where we're gonna do our field trip uh, that Dan will tell you about. Uh, the next, next issue was this one. This was uh, Mary Bunch, knew there was Bunch Airhead here. This is a house and barn, et cetera. This whole property came up for sale. It was very expensive because it had development potential and it had this, uh, it had home, uh, home on it, all these other buildings. So we thought about, could we possibly find funding to buy the whole thing? We thought that was hard. Luckily the owner had a good heart. She wanted to get this uh, protected. Let me go back. And so she agreed to sell the wetland. See, this is the Anna Ray River. The wetland around it and a buffer. Uh, to Natural Land Trust, which we are ultimately going to convey to DNR to be part of the Heritage Trust Preserves. And it is full of bunched area. Here's some of the most beautiful bunched area that I've ever seen is in this stretch. And this creates connectivity then between the Natural Land Trust confluence site that we talked about and the private 
uh, conservation easement and stairhead and sort of Blackwell. So that's a key connector there, connect all that and protect it. All right, so then <laughs> after that, let me move this thing so I can get this saddle. Okay. Uh, then after that, uh, the Native Plant Society, the local community, Native Plant Society, Upstate Forever, Southern Environmental Law Center, again, we wrote a big letter, fought a proposed development that would have been right here on Shelton Road. There's a private home there, big home, was dated, but big home, big farm, white fence, uh, pasture in front, white fence. They were going to put a huge development on it. And we all fought that uh, because of the impact downstream on Blackwell. The community people went out there. John Cook, some of you may know him. He lives right here. He's been a real warrior in all these fights. He investigated and he found Bunched Airhead right back here. Well, we ultimately won that fight before the planning commission and a, a great young couple bought this place for a single family home. So, and they're, they're great people. And so we avoided a terrible development here and any impact. Then we, we noticed this property been for sale for a long time. So we went out and walked it and this back area is full of bunch of airhead populations. John had found something in here and then when he and I went out there and looked more, they're all over the place. The Natural Land Trust went out on a limb without any clear funding mechanism and bought that to secure uh, the, those bunched airhead and also prevent any harmful development around these bunched airhead and behind the site where we had won the battle. And then I want to take you first over here to the east. This is a site that was part of a big track that was on the market. I went out there with the, um, this is the Henry River right here. These are streams that flow into it. I went out there with the real estate developer and low, uh, not developer, uh, agent. And lo and behold, I saw a bunch of airhead at the base of this dam, for the Spence Pond, right in here. Well, but I didn't think we could possibly get the money for this whole big farm because of that population here. Later, a family bought it to build sort of a family compound of three or four houses, but they, they didn't really need this. And if they could sell this, it would help them go with the whole purchase. We brought DNR out there and DNR walked it. Not only that, found some more bunched airhead in here. This is a big wetland. It's what this, this whole thing is one big wetland. So we have now, Natural Land Trust has now bought this and the bunched airhead. And, and DNR is ultimately going to acquire from us, and that's, that's going to be funded. But you can see we're building on this protection of these, this very important wetland area. Now, this is the current issue. You know, this area is development central, and this property on Highway 25 came up for sale for development. And the owner was getting offers from realtors, uh, developers to put 25 to 40 homes in here. All this back here is wetland. This is all developable. And they would come right down to the edge. There's a big beaver pond back here. Now, as far as we can tell, there are no bunched airhead on this site, but there are seeps that just, and wetlands that look like they are clear bunched airhead territory, but we can't find the plants. But all the water that comes through burns, where all, all those plants live, comes off of this site. Of course, that water then comes down and, and I'm sorry, provides the um, water for Blackwell. So uh, Natural Land Trust has signed an option to acquire this. This will also block out if acquired for conservation. We can raise the money to do it, to buy this. It will block out another possible dense development in this very important area. We're trying to keep it in a rural state and protect the most airhead populations. And that's what the people who live there want to happen. So they're our partners in this effort. So that's the current. This is bunched airhead central of planet Earth. This is where the huge, this is the most important concentration of them. So protecting 
as much of this watershed as we can. It's so critical. Then I want to show you one other uh, situation, and then we can have some questions. This is Highway 276, where uh, it heads up to Furman. Publix is over here somewhere. Uh, Publix. There's a bunch of Donalds in here. Over here, there's an apartment development. But the first, and so this is a tributary of the Reedy River, and it flows into Bruce Lake, which is currently a, a development controversy right on Highway 276, and that flows ultimately in the Langston Creek and the Reedy River. There was a proposal to obliterate this wetland and to move all the plants from this site and eliminate this bunched airhead habitat. And the developer got permits to do that, but the developer failed to live up to many provisions of the permits, which we were, and by the way, the uh, Native Plant Society, uh, when Bill Stringer was the president, wrote a letter opposing the original permits, but they did go in place with the number of things the developer had to do in order to deal with the bunched airhead. And the developer didn't do many of those. By that time, then I got by, this is about 2012, I'd gotten into the SCLC, so I sent letters threatening to sue under both the Clean Water Act and Endangered Species Act on behalf of the Native Plant Society. And the developer abandoned the permit. And then a new developer came in and designed the development to avoid the bunch of airhead entirely. That's why it was done this way. So if you drive down the highway and look over those apartments, you're going to see a row of trees down there middle of these apartments, you might wonder why in the world are those trees in the middle of the apartments? And it's because of this very fight. So there are a bunch of airhead here, the headwater seep. There's a beautiful population of bunch of airhead here in a seep, in a seep swamp formation that's off this creek. And there's another one in here. And there's a little one that looks like it ought to have a bunch of air, but doesn't. This site is eat up with exotics. So when we're applying to the Fish and Wildlife Service for money to remove exotics in this site, we'll get half the funding for the Fish and Wildlife Service and have to get half, we're gonna have to raise the other half elsewhere if we get the grant. This is an illustration of the importance of advocacy. This would not have happened, these populations would not exist, would not be, oh, and by the way, <laughs> Natural Land Trust got this property out of a tax sale. The developer let it go up for tax sale. So we, we recovered it. It's now owned by a conservation entity. But this would not have happened without the Clean Water Act, which in conservation has got put in place, without the Endangered Species Act, which advocacy put in place, without special provisions put in by the Planning Commission, without the advocacy of the Native Plant Society, without uh, the legal force, the SELC, or without the Natural Land Trust being there, and um, Upstate Forever participate in the advocacy at the very beginning. So it, it shows you the importance of the collective effort. So uh, that's a new project for the Native Plant Society, which has been out there, by the way, pulling up exotics once before. So you might ask, what can we do to protect the bunched airhead, which is so important for protecting our really natural heritage and landscape in Greenville County? One thing you can do is you can let me know if you know of any bunched airhead that's on private property and not protected, and there's an opportunity to protect it. And we'll try to do that, as you have seen. The second thing you can do is show up for our volunteer days in the fall and winter where we remove exotics. We've been working at the Blackwall Heritage Trust Reserve and made tremendous progress. And we probably will go there again next year. The next thing you can do is you can speak up when one of these development issues come up, when there's a, something before the planning commission, when there's a permit we're objecting to, pay attention to what Upstate Fever, the Native Plant Society, uh, community groups, Natural Land Trust sends out and send in your letters, show up to the meetings, send in your comments, that's terribly important. And the other thing you can do, of course, as we all can, is, as a Native Plant Society has done at times too, is provide financial support for these acquisitions or the projects to remove exotics. 
the only way we protect these sites, there's tremendous pressure to make as much money as possible out, as mu out of as much land as possible with as little protections as possible. And the only way that's going to be uh, avoided is if people like the people on this call stand up, take part, are concerned, take action. And uh, if you continue to do that as you have in the past, we'll protect important parts of natural our natural heritage, have a much more beautiful landscape, and there'll be the bunch there ahead will continue to exist in perpetuity. But if we don't, it'll it'll be wiped out. So I think that finishes my presentation. I'd be glad to take any questions or and, and others can answer questions too. Frank, I have a, a two comments. The first property that you talked about with the, uh, the PVC pipe uh, and your acquisition and how beautiful that population was when you saw it. Yeah. When I was doing the study, there were cattle all through that uh, that seat. There were pro there were uh, plants on the periphery, but there were no plants uh, where the cattle was just mucking up the dirt. In several locations, I have found that cattle have been. Uh, it, part of the history of that uh, uh, that uh, area, that this mucking up by the cows kept the roots from uh, invasive plants from from uh, invading the seed. And after the cattle are gone, within twenty or thirty years, these become huge populations of the plant. Uh, so you know that may make it even harder for us to to preserve these sites because we maybe have to uh, uh, buy some cattle uh, and periodically muck up these uh, these and break up the, the root balls. The, the last piece of property that you showed, I was responsible for designing a uh, transplant there, but I was very suspicious that it was not going to go well. So what I did was I had a whole bunch of students, whole bunch of volunteers come in at the height of the fruiting of the plant. And we mucked up this plant. I mean, we, we were the cattle that were going to uh, make this area uh, uh, flow again. And when we left, there was a sea, just a sea of seeds floating on that sea. So and as uh, and all those populations downstream, I suspect, are the result of that flush of seeds that we produced uh, going downstream. The uh, the transplant was partially successful, but it was in the Reedy River uh, drainage, and flooding was uh, I knew would be a problem, and it proved to be. Uh, but so I'm responsible for uh, aiding and abetting the development of that property uh, partially, but I made sure that if it didn't go well, which I suspect it wouldn't, that there would be plenty seed source there and downstream for the, per 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 the perpetuity of the plant. Well, the, uh, at, it's very interesting what you said about the first site, because that gives me some insight. I guess I saw indications of cattle, but I haven't put two and two together before. Of course, there haven't been cattle on there for a long time, as you point out. But I have wondered, it is a gorgeous swamp, and it looks like almost every inch of it would be bunched airhead territory, but the bunched airhead are just sort of scattered around. So I suspect, Jill, we may have a century or more before it fully recovers from the cattle impact in there. So that may be why you have these beautiful areas that look like they ought to be full of bunched area and there's nothing there. But then you'll, you, as you say, you go further to one edge and there's lots of bunched area. So it may be uh, uh, that, that cattle impact is still going on decades later. And there's that uh, double spring site on 290. And when I was there, there were, it had recently been uh, cattle prodded. 
and that the the use of the the hooves greatly uh, reduced the competition and that population was the best blooming population i had in the whole study hmm. So I think we, I think it's a mid-successional sort of species, and we, you may have to do a little bit more mucking around to maintain them. Just just an idea. Well, I want to talk about our uh, field trip in in May. Uh, when when Jill presented it, uh, her program on Peters Creek in February, we we went out to uh, Peters Creek in March and for a field trip. So after this April program, we're gonna have a May field trip to Blackwell Heritage Preserve. And that will be on May 21st at nine o'clock. And I believe the directions are, are gonna be in the uh, scnps.org under activities, but it's, uh, it's off of Blue, that Blue Ridge Road, which is just past the uh, Sphinx station there at Traveler's Rest. Uh, the next, next turn to your right after you Pass that heading uh, north on South Carolina 25. And, and uh, we have done, in 2021, the Native Plant Society has a survey team that did a survey, a year-long survey on uh, Blackwell Heritage Preserve. So somebody had a question about what other plants uh, grow along with, with the bunched arrowhead. So we'll, we can cover that pretty thoroughly in the, uh, in the uh, field trip if you will. Yeah, and one um, at um, Blackwell, there's uh, the dwarf flower at Heartleaf is there too. What normally what the plants I see, uh, the good plants I see around Bunched Airhead, you will often see the uh, little green wood orchid around the edge. You often see, which is a great plant to see that about about the time or in the early summer they bloom. It's a little confusing though sometimes because the leaf of the little of that wood orchid looks a lot like the uh, bunched arrowhead, but it is not in the water. It's up around the edge of the swamp. So you can sometimes confuse the two. And then um, buckthorn is in there a lot. It's a shrub. Uh, you'll see a lot uh, with bunched arrowhead. Another thing you see with the bunched arrowhead is there is a crayfish. It is often in the, and you'll see the chimneys, the crayfish, and Mary Bunch always associated that crayfish with the uh, much airhead population. It's in a forest, so some, they'll often, you know, these uh, streams will be mature trees amongst, uh, amongst the uh, swamp too. Yeah, there's some green arum in there. There's also the uh, golden club, which I, you know, that's the only time I've, well, there's second time I've ever seen that Golden Club is that there at Blackwell Heritage Preserve. Uh, there's a, a, what was that uh, other rare plant we found up near the uh, Hexastylus, uh, something in the Aster family? You remember that, Jill? Yeah, it was a hel helianthus, I believe. Yeah. Um, my, my, I've slipped since then, so sorry, I can't come up. With if you bird, if you, any of your bird watchers can come out, I don't know if it'll be true this year, but one year, all the, the palm warblers were nesting in the little trees uh, in that field as we walked in, and you could hear them call, you know, they mark the territories, you'd see them all throughout there. So bring your binoculars, it's a good birding site in the spring. Primrose violet is there in abundance too. It's a little white violet that's very pretty. Yeah, the field trips is uh, May 21st. It's on a Saturday. So let me ask that. You may get your feet a little wet, but it, it will be worth it. Yeah, and you can, you can, where we go, you can stay out of the water, uh, out of getting it. And for if you're, you know, you're going to have to be able to walk some distance, but we're not going to, we can, one reason I picked that is there's a population of bunched airhead at the entrance to the pond. And it's a very, very short, it's just, a, I don't know, 50 yards, maybe maybe not that far downhill because you do have to walk back up you know 
um, but downhill to this uh, pond and we walk right in without having to bushwhack and you can see them right there. And then we'll walk, it's up to you, uh, the people who come, but then we'll walk down into the woods, which is not a hard walk, but I want people to see the work the Native Plant Society has done. And you see that native natural bluff that shows. And we also picked it because when you go into Blackwell, it is one of the most, it is a gorgeous view of the mountains and you can see how dangerously developable that property was and what a huge win for conservation it was to get it protected. If it weren't for Frank Holman, it would